Kyra and I am the general manager of Rincon Vitova Insectaries and today we're talking about powdery mildew. So powdery mildew is probably the most common disease question we get calls for in cannabis crops and it can be challenging but it doesn't have to be. Now the interesting thing about powdery mildew is it does not need direct contact with water to spread. So these warm days and these cool nights are the perfect conditions to create powdery mildew. A lot of powdery mildew can be prevented by simply choosing resistant cultivars, by planting with adequate spacing, by thinking about things that incorporate enough airflow throughout your garden so that you don't have these pockets of powdery mildew that settle onto your plants. But sometimes even that isn't enough. So what we really like to talk about for powdery mildew are materials that contain Bacillus subtilis. So this here is a brand name Defensor, but it's a microbe mixture. It's got beneficial microbes in it. Contains Bacillus subtilis and Bacillus cirrus. There are plenty of products on the market that contain Bacillus subtilis, but that is the key microbe that you're looking for for your powdery mildew plan of attack. Anytime we're talking about microbes, prevention is always going to be key. Anytime we're talking about a disease situation, prevention is going to be your best friend. So when you think about the root zone, the roots are in association with beneficial microbes and beneficial fungi down in the soil that are associating with the roots and picking up all those goodies from the soil. So if you think about the root zone as an amphitheater, we want to create standing room only but for our beneficial microbes. We want to crowd out all the possible standing room for any of these pathogenic microbes with beneficial microbes. So we want to start early and we want to inoculate with good things like Bacillus subtilis. There's also a lot of good research out there that says that another material, Trichoderma, there are lots of Trichoderma species on the market, but when you combine Trichoderma with a Bacillus subtilis product, you get kind of a one-two punch against powdery mildew, and you're really going to create a wonderful root zone for your plants, and you're going to have strong, hardy plants that can resist any powdery mildew that's blowing in from your neighbors, blowing in on these cool nights with these prevailing winds that come in. So with Bacillus subtilis products, what you're doing is you're mixing it with water and you're mixing it with a food source and you're either drenching it or you're spraying it onto the plants foliarly. Now Bacillus subtilis is unique in that it can stop the sporulation of the powdery mildew. So you can kill the spores with direct contact from Bacillus subtilis, but you'll still have that white powdery look. You'll still have that white aesthetic to the leaves unless you just get in there and scrub it off or pluck the leaves off. So that is going to look like you still have powdery mildew, but you can contact um, kill with Bacillus subtilis. Now the food source, what we do, we mix up a food source. It's, uh, we call it microbe nutrients. It's got humic acid, um, sugar, it's got dextrose in here some other good things, but really what you're looking for is a carb source. So if you're already feeding with molasses or you've got a nice seaweed as a food source, you don't need to introduce something else like this. You can use what you've already used in your system. And the other really neat thing that I just learned is that you'd think by increasing the microbes, by increasing the concentration of microbes, you'll get more effect from your Bacillus subtilis. That doesn't seem to be the case. Increase your food source. You can go up to 10 times with your carbohydrate, with your sugar, you will get a lot more bang for your buck out of your microbes. You will greatly stimulate their activity by increasing their food. Another good product on the market is uh, potassium phosphite. So there's an interesting uh, material. We have the product name Cali Green, but again, you can, it's potassium phosphite. But the really unique feature of the potassium phosphite is that it stimulates the plant's natural immune response. So it's an SAR activator. Once you use that potassium phosphite, you're stimulating, it's kind of like using an aspirin for us. You're increasing the plant's ability to kickstart its own immune response and react to what's happening on the plant. Powdery mildew is an issue in cannabis. It's a very serious issue in cannabis, but starting early with prevention techniques and applying really strong microbials can help in a biological program. Hello there, this is Casey O'Neill from Happy Day Farms. I get asked a lot, how do I identify powdery mildew? People wanna know what is it, what does it do, how does it affect the plants? So. Powdery mildew is a, is a plant disease. It affects lots of different kinds of plants from squash and cucumbers to cannabis to 
uh, all sorts of different ornamentals, and there are different types of powdery mildew. We're going to focus today on the types that affect cannabis. Um, powdery mildew is a it, it releases spores and it generally comes up from the soil and so you're gonna see by the time you actually see the visible evidence of powdery mildew those that's the sporulation that's the um, expansion of the disease and so one of the things that's very very important with powdery mildew is is prevention is taking preventative measures so that you are avoiding it ever getting going you'll see when you see visible evidence of it what you'll see is a a white spotting on the leaves and it's it can be a little tricky to tell because um, sometimes for instance foliar feeds will leave some sort of a you know a residue and, and the thing with powdery mildew is that it's a white spot but it's if you look really really closely at it you can see that it's a whole bunch of little tiny stipples or speckles and and so it makes this it's a it's a round kind of looks like a little mold spot like a little bread mold growing almost and so um, what will happen is you'll start to see it spotting on the leaves especially on the north sides of the plants on the lower undersides of the plants and this comes back to that point about preventative uh, care in which you're going to really want to clean out your plants especially the north side we cut we cut most of the stuff off of the north side, especially the under branches. Um, we leaf very heavily on the inside. We clean out the whole inside so that there's just nothing but stem until you get out far enough that it's getting sunlight. And that's the, the, the key, the two crucial aspects are sunlight and air movement. And so you want to make sure at all times that you are um, maximizing your sunlight and maximizing your air movement. And so we won't allow plants to get really jungly inside. We clean them up pretty regularly. Every week to two weeks, depending upon how fast they're growing. We'll go through and we'll clean out, for instance, leaves that are starting to die off or, or yellow out. Those come out because they're blocking the sun and they're uh, uh, stopping the air movement from really being able to flow through the plant. Same thing, we don't plant plants close. We like to spread them out so that there's plenty of air movement all the way around. If you end up with a hedge, you're gonna end up with a lot more likelihood for powdery mildew. You want that sunlight to be able to shine down on every side of the plant. You want that air to be able to move through and caress all parts of it without any impedance whatsoever. Same thing, we wanna make sure that, you know, for instance, if we're planted like densely in a grove of trees or all around, you're not going to get nearly as much air movement. So a bright, sunny, airy space is the best place to grow cannabis. Um, and, and likewise for you know, indoor cultivators, making sure that you have enough plant spacing, that you have plenty of air movement, that it's not too humid. Um, and one of the things that you'll see with sun-grown cultivation is that powder mildew starts to show up later on in the plant's life cycle as it's starting to focus more on finishing out. It's not having as much energy to give to growth and to fighting off plant diseases. And so you're likely to start to see powder mildew later on one, you know, there's a, a several suggestions. One, um, cleaning off some of those extra leaves so you're getting more light and air movement. Um, you can spray with a light baking soda solution. That'll often help knock it back some. Uh, making sure that, you know, again, trimming off the most infected leaves can be very helpful because you're removing that source of sporulation from the plant. Also, there are, you know, there's a number of different biological products. I hesitate to recommend any brands, but if you, um, you know, you can do some internet research pretty simply and there's a lot of different things out there and you can, you know, sort of get some testimonial feedbacks and stuff. Um, and then, you know, another thing is a lot of times people will want to let the plant go all the way through full till full finish. And what we find is that if you're starting to see some powder mildew, you can start your harvest a little early and you'll end up with some tops that might be a little tiny bit preemie, but they're still gonna be really, really nice because they're the tops. And taking that extra layer off the plant is gonna let more sunlight and more air movement in and you'll be able to knock that powdery mildew back. The other thing is if it gets to a point where it's so infected that you can't trim off the big leaves where it's starting to get into the buds, at a certain point, it's, it's, it's better to, to, you know, to, to cull it, to, to pull it, to send it by the wayside than it is to um, consume it if you have a compromised immune system, if it's going to be medicine for somebody. If it's just for personal consumption and you're not too worried about it, you know, that's kind of a personal choice, that's up to you. But in general, um, it, it can be better to, if it really starts to get badly infected, to, to, to throw it away. And, and that's a hard thing to do with something that you've grown, and I know that part. And so, you know, again, I leave that sort of up to personal choice, but in general, Powdery mildew can be prevented for the most part by choice of strain, light, and air movement. And those three things are, are very, very important. Typically, like, we, we had a problem a couple years back 
and with uh, Fusarium at her farm. And we realized that uh, it had come in, it was windborne to it. Fusarium is typically moved through contamination of material or tools or pathogen. You're the vector, the human's a vector. But we noticed that it was uh, airborne because you could see fields of it that had come through and you could see the wind patterns moving it. And the fusarium was just devastating. And what we realized was that we, we tried to work on biological inoculation. We tried to work on changing a variety of things. What we changed was the cultivar. And what we found was that the certain gardens have a potential for problems and certain cultivars are prone to those problems in those gardens. And what you find is that your cultivar selection is crucial for eliminating a lot of these issues that when we start to notice that we have problems with the plant, a good example is um, we, had a, we had a light depth this year. And one of the plants that I ran as a test, which was stunning indoor, had too high a yeast count in a depth. That's a huge problem. What you find is that don't depth the plant. What people try to do is they try to take a varietal and make it work into a circumstance and it doesn't what you find is that you have to substitute and change what you're doing in terms of your strain selection. And so when we had the fusarium issue, as much as we wanted to run anything possible through the media to counteraffect it, it basically was strain specific. I didn't have it through varietals. I had it through a single varietal. And in this case, it was green crack. And so green crack, which is a very hardy, tough producer, for whatever reason, was prone to a fusarium outbreak at this particular farm and we, we did it two years in a row, and first year we had two, next year we had 20, third year we had none because we switched out the cultivar. And we haven't had the problem since. And so these are the kind of situations that you have to be aware of, that when you have problems, a lot of times we can, we can try to fix what we can, but we also have to realize that we're not in business for a single season. Farmers are farming for time and that it's your knowledge base over time that matters. And that's really what genetic material is, is that it's holding enough material genetically to work in cl hot climates, dry climates, wet climates, cold climates, all within the same genetic packaging. And that way you have an ability to stay within a flavor range, stay within a chemotype range, but have the ability genetically to work. And, and these, are th these are huge things that we're gonna have to work with in farming because fixing the problem after the fact is different than preventing the problem before the fact.